And the idea was way back when was that you don't call daddy when he's at work. Yeah. It's like daddy has gotten, you know, has has gotten like cut off from that life. We can't bother him. He's at work. You know, I don't know. And maybe again, someone has the data. I don't know how many moms went to work and said, don't call me while I'm at work. Hmm. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to a podcast I do called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. We go live on Facebook first, then it goes to YouTube. Then we put it in four or five places the podcast can be found. And if you're interested in today's conversation, a couple of things. First of all, please like it in the interweb sense of liking the, the thing that you see and sharing it. And then secondly, uh, if you want to get in touch with my guest today, who I'm guessing a number of you will, um, you don't have to sit there trying to figure out how to do it. We post links to the folks we talk to. If they're authors, there's links to their books. If they're people like my guest today, um, uh, Dr. Risa Riger, we will post links so you can get in touch with her. So just rest assured on all that. You can just relax and listen. So today I'm talking with Dr. Risa Riger uh, as a clinical psychologist and in international speaker and entrepreneur. She's the founder of 93% Consulting, creator of Disruptive Self-Ownership, and has been on the advisory council of mind, mindfulness without <laughs> borders. Um, I was about to say mindlessness without borders. That's another organization. Um, I know uh, Dr. Riger because we met through a mutual acquaintance, friend of mine and hers, uh, Jose Zilstra, and we've both been involved in things. I think um, the Women's Business Collaborative. I don't know. You know, you've been on that as well. Uh, we have a lot of connections, but most recently I've been working on a new book, which we're not going to talk about because it's far, far from being published yet. My agent is just pitching it, but Dr. Riger was kind enough to read it and give me some really good notes. I have a nice long quote from her in the text, and I'm really grateful for that. So we've had some really nice connections. Um, a few days ago, I was part of a, a small group seminar, I guess you'd call it, that Dr. Riger was leading. Um, in which we were doing, uh, you know, we were basically listening to her talking about what she does. So I'm kind of well prepped for this. Uh, Risa, let's just start with you now. Where, where are you sitting as we speak? You're in, where are you? Right now, I am in New Rochelle, New York. Okay. And that's where you also live, correct? Yes. This is where I also live. Yes. And I know from our previous discussions that um, you do a lot of individual counseling with people. I, I, I hate it. I, I'm not good on technical stuff. Would you call it therapy? Would you call it um, life counseling? Would you call it, you know, what? what when you're interacting with a client, what are you doing? First of all, that's a great question and really important distinctions because in my private practice, that is a clinical practice hmm. and that is treatment. Those are people who are coming in for treatment and treatment really covers a very wide area. Then there are people who want help and they want to develop themselves, but it's not necessarily within a treat or treat work framework. And so they can come in for, for coaching, they can come in for consulting, for advice. And that is a different, a different kind of bucket. And in that regard, I speak with companies and teams and individuals and and be of service in that way. Let me let me jump right into one thing that's su substantial here. Can you describe you, you know your creator of disruptive self ownership, which is I guess is a concept that's almost trademarked. It's something that you've developed. Can you just describe what that means before we move on? Sure. And so disruptive self ownership. Let's think of it this way, because in psychology, we deal with a lot of abstract ideas. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I like to do is take abstraction and make it more tangible so we can really grab a hold of it and run with it. Yeah. And so so if you think about it, you know, we don't wear shoes we wore when we were eight years old. Right. And so we need to 
update ourselves. We need to, we don't have phones from 20 years ago. Mm. We update our phones, we update our apps, and we also need to update beliefs that we hold and stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves mm. that may not lo longer be true. And so sometimes we get stuck in old versions, old stories of who we are, and we really need to update and understand and really dig in and formulate who we are now and having that bridge to where, you know, what we've experienced earlier on. Yeah. Now, usually I start with a bunch of personal things in the sense that we dig in, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm a writer and a lot of my stuff is autobiographical and I write from what I know and so forth and so on. So I like to do all that. But with you, I'm going to do something different because Ernie posted something very good. That's my producer, Ernie, who makes this podcast. Um, and he has a question that I think is really great. And I want to lead off with that because I think it'll take us to some interesting places. And then, you know, we'll relax a little bit and talk about um, personal things and, and, and who we each are. Uh, and here's his question. As an expert in change, um, he, he's quoting you here, and he wants this to turn into a question. As an expert in change, my goal is to help people thrive at all stages of their personal and professional lives. I believe that positive change can happen at any point. Let's start this journey together. Now, he appends a question to that. That's a quote from you. Yes. And Ernie wants to know how you feel that applies in a particular way now, post-COVID pandemic, as we come out of that period and move into kind of unknown territory in so many ways. Politically, we have a midterm election coming up, a presidential election soon after that. We're in an era of mass gun violence. We're, there's, you know, there's a war going on in the Ukraine with Russia attacking a sovereign state. It seems like we have just been dealt a hand that forget the big geopolitics, but just on a personal level, speaking for me personally, that I have found incredibly unsettling. Uh, and I know other people have too. And then I've also seen some great opportunities in it in terms of the time I've spent with my grandchildren at home during the COVID lockdown, sort of running Camp Schaefer for them. It isn't all negative, but it is consistently one thing. This is all different. We're in a very different place than we all were a few years ago. So your quote is great. And I'm going to repeat it. As an expert in change, my goal is to help people thrive at all stages of their personal and professional lives. I believe that positive change can happen at any point. Let's start this journey together. Two questions come out of that. How have people you're dealing with been especially challenged in the context of today, COVID and all the rest of it? And secondly, I know you're talking about change of mind in terms of not bringing, you know, we don't wear the shoes, as you said, we did when we were eight and we have different ideas. But how do we get used to something different than wanting to change? And that is change being forced on us by an environment that none of us fully understand and we can't see the future clearly. And it seems to me this is really unsettling and is right up your street. And I could be quiet now for the rest of the session and you get out your whiteboard and do your stuff. First of all, no whiteboard. No, we I know. Are, that. We are, I know. I know. We're here. We're, we're here. We're here together. Yeah. And and. This is a great time to talk about change because one of the things we experienced with the pandemic, now I don't know, you're in Massachusetts, right? Yeah. And I'm here in New Rochelle. And one of the reasons why I say that specifically versus saying I'm in Westchester is because New Rochelle was ground zero for COVID. And so when we, when we you know, heard about COVID, the next thing we knew was that we were shut down. The National Guard was coming. And I thought, what is, what's the National Guard going to be doing here? Well, the National Guard came here not to corral us in, right, but to really help to continue essential services for the elderly and for children, you know, for people who may have had, you know, food insecurity to be able to to be able to be of help and be of service, which they were, and it was really fantastic. But here we have change that is not incremental. It's not of choice. And there isn't that kind of runway of, I'm going to make a decision about changing this. Mm -hmm. It was change that came down on, our, on us. And not only that, but it was change that was really unknown. Mm -hmm. 
We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what was going to happen. All one day, that was it. Nobody was going into work. Kids weren't going into school. We didn't know how to get food. And so when you want to talk about unsettling change, it was really a place of overwhelm. And I think that overwhelm is a big word for now. And that that for people who are experiencing it, and by the way, I, I just want to point out very clearly that overwhelm doesn't mean that you're either not good enough or not resilient enough or, or not enough on, in any way, shape, or form. Overwhelm is because it's a lot. Hmm. And when there's a lot that happens to you, at you, all at once, it doesn't give you that opportunity to parse out. You know, you don't have a, a clear, well, what would be the next step? It's like, sure. oh my gosh, how do we, how do we carry life on in this way? Hmm. And so, so I think that's an important start point. And so people really didn't know where to start. So why do I say positive change can happen at any point? It's because as human beings, we are built for change. Hmm. Our, our brain are built for change. And we have something called neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of our brains to change with deliberate, uh, deliberate intention. And also that we can, we can really assist our brains in this way. Hmm. And we have the capacity for it because we have the capacity to build new neural connections in our brains to help us move from a particular pattern that we've been working in to develop something new and different. You know, we get to, we get to choose the amount of difference that mm. we want to have and then be able to develop that for ourselves. So we are in continual change now. And that is that can be a stressful place because it's not like, well, we've gotten here or we've gotten there. It's still evolving. And just like us, we're evolving beings. This is happening in a very dramatic way. And people are still trying to figure out where they're working, whether they're working hybridly. It looks like the kids are really back in school, which is a huge shift for people. And so the transition has been happening and people are there's a there's some fatigue that's going on, right? With mm. decision fatigue and just adapting, 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 and having this constant kind of requirement that we adapt. Mm. And yeah, I want to just go back for yeah. one minute to something before we go on that I find very interesting. And I think even the book I was working on was related to this and you gave me a quote on this. Um, and, and certainly I've talked about this in other things. It, it was very surprising to me a few years ago to start reading about this neuroplasticity of the brain. And it's more than just psychological in the sense, it's not just choosing to do better or to you know, drink less or whatever it might be, that the, the brain actually, to some extent, rewires and recreates itself based on the habits. Those can be good habits, or it can reflect things that I've seen in studies where um, people who are in positions of power over others gradually lose their ability to, to feel empathy unless they work very mm -hmm. hard not to. Uh, this can be negative as well. So yes. you, kind of be, you kind of become what you do. I mean, that sounds very simplistic, but <laughs> it's a very interesting thing to me. So we can choose to do things that we feel awkward with and get used to them and become more that person, or we can go the other way and do things that actually change us in ways that that are hurtful to us and to people around us. And I, I, I you, where I kind of um, was surprised was to learn that these are actual physical changes in the brain. It isn't like you decide to be nicer, uh, you know, by behaving in a certain way, you actually become more that a, a different person. Your brain actually rewires. It's a, it's a physical change. Yes. You want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Because the, the first thing is that you have to become aware. Yeah. And basically, we do what we do because we've done what we've done. Mm -hmm. Our brain loves patterns. It's like a pattern finder. And so what happens when we're confronted, this is a simple, you know, simplified version, but when we're confronted, whether we're experiencing or perceiving, knowing, you know, in a situation, first, we need to 
perceive it. Hmm. Then there's an assessment. And in that assessment, the brain is kind of going click, 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 click. Do I know this? Have we done this? Oh yeah, I've done this before. And in this situation, this is what I do. So there's perception, you know, perception, assessment, and re reaction mm -hmm. to it, right? And so, and uh, the brain does it incredibly quickly. So it's upon us to bring awareness mm -hmm. to what that pipeline looks like. You know, it's like a super highway. And if you've done that a million times, right? Right. It's so natural. It's so, it's just so fluid. It happens automatically. Mm -hmm. There's an automaticity involved in that. So what we're doing to make change is that we're, we're substituting automaticity with deliberate, intentional. Mm -hmm. And you can't be deliberate and intentional unless you bring awareness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes at the beginning when we're making change, you know, um, you know, as all of us have in our relationships and our work, you know, we swear, I'm not going to say that again to my spouse, my kids, whatever. And then we say it again. Then, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I can't believe I did that. And then the next time you're like, I'm going to be, I'm going to really work on being more aware of that so that you can disrupt what is in place mm -hmm. and begin to build an alternate response. And that happens over time, you know, think about it. If you're on the beach, right. And you're just like, you're, you're finding a tow path and then you go over that path over and over and over again until it really becomes, you know, a, a very clearly marked, you know, exactly where to go. It's, you know, where you, where you go with it. And maybe at some point somebody decides they want to pave it so that we need to build our own paths in our brains to be able to compete with what's there now mm. and slowly over time the more we do it the more awareness we bring we can make decisions when we're at a decision fork of am i going to say this where i know what's going to happen or am i going to try something else and see mm. that feels more consistent with who i am the you know it feels more like me and i don't want to do that anymore because i know it doesn't get us to good places Hmm. Yeah, it, it, uh, I, I'm going to come back to this subject, but now I'm going to back up a little bit and do the personal part. What was your own path into what you're doing now? Give me, give me a little bit of personal history. I, you know, you've done all sorts of things. I'm just curious about what brings you to this moment here of being a clinical psychologist. How did you get there? And I'm not just talking about the, the professional stuff or the academic interest, but on the personal side, um, you know, what's that story? If you want to dig in for a minute, just Sure. Let us know a little bit. Sure. Well, you know, human beings are multifaceted, mm. and that education is really important. But there are many different kinds of education. Mm. There's education that we get in schools, and there's education that we get in life. And so, life education was very important uh, for me, and so I took time off. Um, after, you know, after high school, and I took a little bit of time off again after college to really just be able to be in the world, get a better understanding of people. And also, I think it's so important that we get to experience ourselves when we're in a different backdrop. It's like, well, who am I if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't speak my language? Mm. Who am I when I'm lost? Who am I when I'm frightened in, in this kind of situation? Mm. And so we learn about ourselves and we develop a, a repertoire. We develop a different sense of understanding and life lived. And so then I was very, very interested in what's the relationship between life and and biology, you know, and so at that point in time, it was about what is psychological bio, you know, psychological, biological interface. And that was my path in college, um, which and the University of Southern California, they gave me just incredible opportunities and supported me in, in my work as I was looking at um, just a, a fast drive through on this etiology and non-medication treatment of asthma from a psychosomatic perspective. So what does that like mind body integration look like? And from our conversations together, Frank, which have been just so 
wonderful and we really go there. Like mm. one of the big words is integration, mm. that we're not necessarily a this or a that. Yeah. We're a this and that. Yeah. We, we, have a, we can have a lot of ands mm. and some of our, our challenge in, 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 in ways that can be an easier challenge or a more difficult challenge is how do we integrate that into who we are? And so that's a perspective that I've taken to come to my work. I find people really incredible and interesting. Everybody has their own story. Even with the very young children I work with, they are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that if you give people a chance, even very little people, and you use language or metaphor that they can connect with, put them in an environment where they feel safe and secure and really speak to them developmentally appropriately, but with a level of respect. And it's an interesting thing, you think, to talk about being with a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old or five-year-old in a respectful fashion. They mm. get it and you help them become their and. You support them in that integration mm -hmm. and help them become their end. And so I love my work. The people that I work with are working to really put the pieces, to really integrate these aspects of themselves and really break through beliefs uh, that don't hold true anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is that when we talk about letting go or about growth, it doesn't mean that we get amnesia. You know, it's really important. I mean, we remember and we know what has happened. However, we take a different narrative with us. We, we, when we don't address what's happened, it doesn't get metabolized and adequately worked through. So we wind up taking all of that with us in the present. Hmm. And when we do address it, we remember it. It's not that the memory doesn't go away, but we're not taking exactly, we can remember how we felt when these yes. things happen, but it doesn't mean that we're back feeling that now. And that's the, that's the position. I know this is a little bit of a long answer here, but hang with me you know, kind of hang with me, that we may know how we felt, but we don't have to respond as if we're still there. Mm -hmm. We can take our strengths, our perspective, and we need to take our strengths and our perspectives and the coping skills that we have now to look at what's happened so that we're not still in that same emotional space with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to divert a little bit from what we're talking about. You know, as you know, because we've talked about this book, I have um, Fall in Love, Have Children Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy with a big poster of it behind me here. That overlaps very, very heavily with what you're talking about in terms of respecting children. And Ernie sent a note here saying that's what you do with your art, you share with your babies. And, you know, my, my sense is that where you and I overlap um, is maybe in talking to people, uh, me through some of the books and you in the, in the work that you do. Um, I, I'll just make a, a kind of an observation and see what your, your take on this is. You know, I've been doing a lot of, of these discussions on my podcast with, with a lot of women who are in various positions of influence um, in the business world and so forth. My daughter is a CEO of a company in New York. Um, I've been interfacing a lot as, as someone who's a father and grandfather with people who are either in the cycle of parenting now very intensely themselves or at the time of life I'm at with grandchildren and others. I, I think we, we live in a time when a lot of people in terms of changing ideas are rejecting some things and trying to come up with a better solution for themselves personally. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm talking to a lot of young men uh, in play parks, for instance, where I take my granddaughter, Nora, after I pick her up at school. Uh, they're young guys in their, their late 20s, mid 30s to early 40s. They're there with a couple of strollers and a, and a child after school. They've made a decision to sort of stick with the post-COVID program of working from home. 
Um, they are doing the kind of work that women for decades have been challenging men to do in terms of helping pick up with the child care. And then they found they actually like it better than what they were doing before. Conversely, I'm meeting some women who in the 70s and 80s were very much uh, high powered feminists, very much part of that movement, who are now doing some serious rethinking, saying, why did we fight so hard to get into the male dominated business world? only to find that what we were being asked to do is essentially do what these men had done, which is make a mistake about priorities in their own lives rather than challenging the whole thing. In other words, rather than the lean in idea <laughs> of asking for a place at the table, why not challenge the whole table? So it's interesting because when it comes to these family relationships, I am talking to people in my podcast and also in person and also in reaction to my book that is showing me that there is a constant running through our culture right now. And that is that there are some people who have been given sort of received wisdom, and this is how it's gonna be. And they are, they are beginning to either reject or rethink the level of striving for career they were asked to do at the expense of everything else. You know, put off getting married until your career is set, put off having a child, freeze your eggs, wait, until you've got that you know, thing you're after. A certain amount of money has to be in the bank before I'm gonna have a serious relationship. When you're in college, you're too young to do anything but just study because the world's gonna demand all this. A lot of people are feeling that corporate America has stolen their passion for life and not given them much in return. And they're at various stages of their life. I meet men my age, I'm pushing 70, you say, wow, I wish I knew now with my mm -hmm. grandchildren then what I know now, and I would have been a different father. I meet women who are saying, I came out of that 70s, 80s mix of high powered feminism where we were demanding a place at the table, but somewhere along the line, we also forgot that we too wanted families and challenging men to change what they were doing, not just asking for a place at their table. So I've gone on too long, but you understand what I'm talking about. You've seen my book, but I, and I'm not just trying to talk about that, but I'm asking you what you're running into out there in this area of work-life balance and wanting to change and not being satisfied with what we were given. Mm -hmm. let's, let's start with the terminology that's used. Um, and I hear this more from men. It's like wearing the hat, right? Yes. And I think that historically, I, I don't have, if anybody has the data on this, please send it over. But I think that historically that came from the idea that, you know, when the, the you know, the man was going out to work, that mm -hmm. he'd go to the closet, you know, take his hat and take his lunch, his briefcase, whatever it was, and, and go to work. Then you come home and, and so at work, you're at work, and then you come home, you take your hat off, and then you're at home. Mm -hmm. And And the idea was, way back when was that you don't call daddy when he's at work. Yeah. It's like daddy has gotten, you know, has, has gotten like cut off from that life. We can't bother him. He's at work. He, and, and so that's one piece. So what happened, and I think with, with women is that women have a different orientation. And so my, if you can stay with me, and this is the visualization that just came to me um, and I use is that with women, you're not putting on one hat and then changing into another hat and then changing into another hat. Hmm. Like the hats are all there, whether you're at, you know, at work, at home with the kids, you're a daughter to, you're a daughter to your parents who you're taking care of, you're a friend, that the hats are always there. And what we do is we kind of tilt, you know, where am I more hmm. at this moment? Where do I need to be more? What, what, what kind of behavior outcomes thinking do I need to have under, under all of this, but it's always there. Hmm. You know, I don't know. And maybe again, someone has the data. I don't know how many moms went to work and said, hmm don't call me while I'm at work. Hmm. Or someone said, you know, you can't call your mother because your mom's at work. And I also just want to go back to um, an important point about being a mother, which is that being a mother 
is a very is a, a small role for women that as as a woman and and certainly up for all of us but i'm going to just speak to women and i'm being very binary now so i'm deliberately being binary but there's not a binary component to this but that we can be nurturers influencers and and caregivers in different ways to many, many people around us. Mm. And so even if you don't physically, biologically have your own children, it doesn't mean that you're not a nurturer or a caring person and an important influence Mm. to younger humans around you. Um, But that there's this idea that it's not just, you know, you don't go in and forget you have kids or feel like there's nothing that you want to do with them, you know, or that like they got to keep it together until you get back. And so there's much more fluidity with it. And in that fluidity, there's, you know, just a, um, a more, it, it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, mm. but you don't give up all of who you are. Now, what you were talking about is that women coming in to organizations, and I think there are people who can speak on that better than I can, but you know, needing to slot into what the male role was. Hmm. And what's happening, uh, thankfully, is that we're that, that is being challenged. And men are also challenging this as they as they have more freedom. I mean, this is about, we're talking about basic freedom. And when you're stuck in in role expectations, and oftentimes when these role expectations are very rigid, and you know this so well, that there is a level of rigidity and enormous constriction that happens with that. And so you miss out. You miss out. Mm. And And where the importance is, is just... But it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, you know, a woman in a role that where there are male expectations. I mean, it's a different, it's sure. different. And so when we give people space and we let people really experience and think as you have, uh, that there's tremendous freedom in that. And there's tremendous freedom for a man who says, you know, yes. Um, my kid like making you know dad's peanut butter and jelly for my kids and they go daddy no you make the peanut butter and jelly you make it your way and that there's this there's this micro connectedness that happens on all sorts of levels there's tremendous um a sense of of having gotten so much you know, from it, so that when we are less constricting and more open in our in our roles, mm. that it gives us more. It may be more. It may be harder. Maybe more responsibility, but it also opens us up for the possibility of more joy. Yeah, yeah. I think you know one of the benefits right now too, of course, of of some of the discussions on gender, sexuality, sexual preference that started with the, the, the gay rights movement in the 70s and 80s, and now has has become part of the whole discussion about transgender, this and that. You know, there's a lot, there's a downside to all this in the sense that it's become very politicized and maybe is a, a problematic for, for Democrats in the election because it can be easily caricatured by the right. But one of the upsides is, is I think, again, it's a little bit of a chipping away at the idea of these hard and fast roles. You know, I, I've been very interested recently reading a book by um, an author who lived with the sand people, the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert in the 1950s, um, Elizabeth uh, Marshall Thomas. Uh, her dad founded Raytheon and took her and her brother out to live in the Kalahari Desert in Namibia at that time. She describes this culture that had not ever met anyone from outside. They were the first people that had ever gone in there. No one even knew they were there. Um, but what was so interesting to me is that, you know, we have this this wrong idea that somehow traditional roles are, you know, a male hierarchy, 
patriarchy and so forth. We think of that as tradition. Actually, her book is called The Old Way. And she's dealing with people who have been in the same part of the Kalahari, believe it or not, for 80,000 years. That's a long time uh, with no outside influence. The, and she, did, she came with a 1950s mentality of a young woman. This was not 1970s feminism looking for proof or anything like this. It was just amazing. Um, what she found was there was tremendous gender equity. Uh, roles of men and women when it came to childcare were completely interchangeable. The whole village pitched in. Um, the men who brought the meat in for people to eat after long arduous hunts chasing antelope that had been poisoned with poison darts took days and days and days. Were, were not greeted as heroes who were then in charge of the village because the, the women and the old people who made the arrows actually distributed the meat. They had all these things built in that sound like a modern invention of post 1970s feminism or some sort of evolutionary step. Actually, the book kind of changed my mind on something and that is really how to define tradition. The traditional role of men is as caregivers. And there are these roles that have been studied um, in terms of the biology of caregiving and, and, and not just the neural pathways, but also the hormones and all the rest of it that show mm -hmm. that men have that same level of affection. So what I wanted to, to, to ask you in, the con in that context um, is that, you know, uh, have you also come to a place as I have really recognizing that our idea of what traditional roles is are not really traditional at all. They are a construct of modern city living agra and agrarian societies that have nothing to do with, with the really ancient roots of the human race. And in a way, you know, a lot of what we think of as modern steps of gender equity and these other things are really going back to something far more ancient um, that, that has always been present in humankind, and that is the ability of both males, females, non-binary people, and others to be caregivers as a basic ingredient for all human survival. A lot of reading I've been doing has pointed me in a direction that, say, 10 years ago, I had no idea about. What do you think? Well, I, th I think that it's so important that we open ourselves up and let in new possibilities. And mm -hmm. that with that, that we begin to brace, embrace uh, discomfort. And that with change, there's a level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And somehow, you know, there's so much of what we hear and we're sold to about has to do with being comfortable. And being comfortable is great. You know, there's nothing wrong with being comfortable. However, life isn't all comfortable. And in order to think about new things and try new things in your life and expand your horizons, expand your life experience and your thinking as a human being, you need to go to some uncomfortable places and whatever we may change, there's a discomfort. And so in thinking about this you know, old version of what does it mean to take care of one another, mm -hmm. that there's a level of interdependence. Now, of course, Men can't have babies and, you know, up to this point in time, they can't nurse. But beyond that, being a caregiver, being a tender person, opening, offering options for, for you know, offspring is, is a wonderful thing. And, mm -hmm. and that for babies, babies can't be loved too much. Yeah. You can't get too much love. Like, that's enough love for today. Let's, let's hold it back. You know, enough love. Let's move on. You know, that's all you get. And that's not how it is. I mean, we need love. We need love. And mm. what, is the, what is love about? One of the pieces of love is about being noticed, right? Being seen, being heard, and being valued. Mm. And those are, those are foundational. And also that what we look for, you know, there's something about, you know, why, why do you feel a certain way when you're with someone? There's something that happens where you feel felt, right? You feel mm -hmm. felt, you feel like that person just really gets me. Mm -hmm. And it is a profound experience to, to feel that to mm. feel that in a relationship and with our, with our children and then moving along with our, in our relationships to be in attunement. 
and to be able to tune into someone, to be in attunement with them. It's sort of like you're, you're listening to the same radio station or listening to the same podcast at the same time, right? Mm. That you're in attunement with, within each other, with each other. It doesn't, it doesn't happen every single minute of every single day, but it's there enough. And there's a terminology called good enough parenting, right? And so no one is perfect. I want to say this right now. Perfect is the pathway to suffering because perfect doesn't exist. It's this odd construct and everybody knows that there's nothing that's perfect unless you want to get into, you know, a tautological, there's the imperfect, the perfection of imperfection and we can go there. But, you know, if you think about people who in history have had tremendous impact Hmm. and have helped change the world in wonderful and positive ways, not a single, and you find someone like, you know, think of who that is for you. Think of that person that, or many people that is for you, Hmm. that person wasn't perfect. And so we use perfect as kind of a club to knock ourselves over the head with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me uh, pause here a minute and just reintroduce you. Um, for those who are watching or listening, this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. I'm Frank Schaefer. I'm talking to uh, Dr. Risa Reiger, who is a clinical psychologist today. And I want to shift for a moment and ask you this. Um, you were talking about working with little children and also, of course, adults. Give me a couple examples of the typical sort of questions people are coming to you with most often. What do you hear a lot of as you counsel and work with grownups? Talk about the ages that people are when they ask certain kind of questions and, and what are the things that are bringing children to you? Or I should say parents who are bringing children to you. You know, Maybe start with the kids and, and then talk about the grownups. If we were a fly on the wall listening to sessions, which we obviously would not because it would, you know, people have uh, confidential privileges with you. But if we were there, sort of doing our version of the, um, the TV show that I've been watching episodes of recently, Couples Therapy, which is very interesting. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, little, little aside here, if I was going for couples therapy, I would not be signing up to let a camera in with my wife and I, but that's just maybe my sense of privacy. That said, uh, there it's an interesting program. But if 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 we were watching some recordings of the kind of sessions you're doing, what are people bringing you, grown-ups and children, and why? What are kids doing there, and what are what kind of things are you helping them with? And take mm-hmm. that wherever you want. But I'm just curious. I, I'm sure people who are listening to you would like to know, you know, what people are talking to you about, both grown-ups and kids. What sorts of things are bringing them to you, and And then what are you telling them? Okay. That's a huge question, Frank. Of course it is. But cast your mind out. Think of some real clients and take us there. Yeah. So there there are two words. One is regulation and that children are having difficulty with regulation, meaning Mm -hmm. that they're having difficulty with anger, frustration, uh, those are two big ones and really having difficulties with with big feelings that they can't seem to really grab a hold of. And some of this is, you know, we can't say piece by piece, but certainly, you know, we know that there's a mental health crisis going on. Sure. We hear about that all the time. And that that children are really having difficulty with their with their self regulation mm-hmm. of feeling very anxious or you know feeling very anxious very angry just unable to um, you know if you think about turning on a faucet you know in the old fashioned kind that you just turn the knob that you can put out you know a little bit of water or sometimes you need a lot of water and so it becomes very hard for kids at this point to regulate and you know to be able to have that for themselves and so regulation and difficulty with regulation and feeling overwhelmed what are you the know, same, what are, what are some of the things contributing to their difficulty with regulation or 
making them feel overwhelmed. Throw throw some things out that are, might be contributing to this situation you're calling a, a kind of mm -hmm. a, a crisis. What is it that's creating the crisis? Why? What do these kids have in common? What is unsettling them so much? Well, you know, every child, every child is different. Sure. And every child metabolizes situations differently. And there are some kids who are more like Teflon, right? And things just slide over them. I mean, you've got a lot, you've got children, sure. you've got grandchildren, Frank, and, you know, there are some kids who temperamentally, they're, things just slide off of them. And then there are kids who are a little bit more like Velcro. Yes. It just kind of kind of sticks. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that one child is good. And I'm using this very specifically good, yeah. or bad, or, or one child is healthy, one child is unhealthy. It's really about how, how things hit you, how you experience as a human being. Mm -hmm. And just because there's a young child who's having difficulty at this point, and maybe there's trouble in relationships or when minor things happen, they're not rolling with the punches easily, mm. or I'm going to change that terminology. I've just decided I don't like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, let's, let's erase that and have a redo on that. Yeah. That, that, that they're, they're, experiencing situations and they're not necessarily big stuff it's little sure. stuff you know you need to stop doing this and go do that we're going to do that uh something happens there's a disappointment there's a frustration and that the response isn't commensurate with the you know kind of what's happened mm -hmm. and so you can have a, a child who is just extremely reactive mm. Uh, if they don't have the sock that they wanted that morning, it's not like, you know, I, I want that sock and then you can move on. It can really become a real sticking point. But if you look at the statistics, because there's people yes. who have been following this for a long time now. And so you're talking about individual cases, which I'm sure is the case. I mean, what you're saying yes. sounds completely true, but statistics and the rise in certain things you know, it's like looking at rates of lung cancer. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. There's all these different things yes. that contribute. But if you happen to live in an industrial zone with a high toxicity in the air, a lot of people may have different paths to this, but it's now a trend. So when you look at, for instance, statistics on childhood loneliness, teenage loneliness, yes. suicide rates, yes, these are spiking. Yes. And, and so it isn't just individual children. Something yeah. is going on. And if you had to, you know, when we hear social media, we hear uh, childhood exposure to very violent porn, we hear the divorce rate, the number of family breakups, you know, the reconstituted families, unsettling children, there are a lot of things going on. And then, and then just sort of, in, you know, the speed of change in culture. With you dealing with these kids, are there some through threads forget your ability to help them as a therapist, yes. just as an observer of our culture, what are, yes. the, what are the big strokes that are really contributing? I've thrown some stuff out, not because I'm saying that's what it is, but just sort of to give you a, an in, as it were, to talk about a larger frame of reference than the individual care of a child. There's a lot of expectation and stress on our kids. And what we know is that stress levels for teenagers have hit the mm. same level as for adults. And so our expectations are, you know, having kids participate, but there's, you know, having downtime, having downtime for kids that isn't on a screen. Yes. You know, there's, you know, there are the children who are over scheduled, the children who, you know, you can't just go out and have a, have a little game. Um, you know, my, my kids, I'm a mom, I've yeah. got, I have two daughters who are, you know, young women at this point, but there's, you know, that kind of that, that engine that amps up more and more. I remember like, I'll just say, I remember taking my daughter, one of my daughters for ice skating lessons. And mm. I thought, it'll be fun. She'll like skating. And all of a sudden it's like, well, we can put her on a hoist and you can get these ice skates so she can do the next step. It's like, you know what, if she can go around the rink and have a fun time, not everything has to be amped up. And so, you know, for our kids who, and our kids see 
what's going on, you know, further down the road. Sure. Our girls see what they're supposed to look like and, and you know, different ways that, you know, that media uh, really represents the women and women, not only roles, but bodies. There's that level of gender toxicity, both for girls and for boys. And that these expectations of children are really difficult. Now, it doesn't mean that you should have no expectations, but between no expectations and, you know, our child needs to be head of the school and the star player of sure. their sports team and all of these other things, like it adds up and adds up and adds up. In addition to which, you know, there can be social media for good and internet for good. I mean, look, here we are now you and I having this wonderful conversation and we're able to reach all of these people. Um, But it, for our children, it doesn't work so well. And so they're not, they're not interacting as much. They're not learning their social skills. They're not in, in relationship more with people. And so there's these pseudo relationships. It's not just one thing. And you're Mm -hmm. right that it's a trend that has just amped and amped and amped as we we're we are social beings our brain is a social organ we need people and yet there's so much that's happening that keeps us away from one another and so with the pandemic was also this tremendous loneliness Mm. and isolation and not interacting and as a kid you know, you go to school and your parents really don't know everything that happens. You have your, your school life and parents have their work lives. And there was just a requirement that there be this melange that happened. Yes. And it's not a, it's not an easy one. And it's not that, it's not that people didn't want that and they didn't try their best and they didn't try or there was inadequacy. I mean, when we look on Instagram, you know, and you see like you're basically going, oh my God, I have so much decision fatigue. I can't even decide what we're going to have for dinner tonight. And then there's someone else posting, you know, we've taken recycled materials and we're making a representation of the Chicago skyline Um, that there's a lot of that, you know, we have to be so careful about how we reference ourselves and what we do with that. I did a short, um, even before the pandemic, I did a short little study you know, of, of interviewing teenagers. I want to know like, what is going on? And so I interviewed with parental permission, younger teenagers, older te- college students, post-college students. And they were talking about the younger generation, how they felt bad for them because there was so much happening on social media mm-hmm. of needing to be part of it and how we get in, how we have relationships, what our relationships look like and how do we get to be kind to people, right? When there's, you know, when you, when there's so much um, unkindness that can be happening. Mm. Let's switch it's, to it's the grown It's hard to grow up. Yeah, to grow, grown ups. Let's switch to the grown ups now. Who are you seeing and what are they asking you? And again, they're all individuals. I know that. Of course. And so forth and so on. Um, but what's it, give me some generalities here that okay. just, you First know, of what's, all, one of your, what's your day look like when you're talking to, you know, a bunch of people? Hey, uh, first of all, the people that I work with are really just wonderful, competent, capable people, really and truly. And so one of the things that happens to us is that we under, we overvalue our negatives and we overvalue our positives. Hmm. And so low self-esteem is one of the most pressing problems at this point in time. Uh, some statistics are it, it's hitting about 85% of the population worldwide. Yeah. That people are really experiencing low self-esteem. And the question is, why is this happening? And how does it manifest? Mm. And does it manifest? And I'm not going to go. First of all, we couldn't go out for a while, but I'm not going to go out. Who really wants to be with me? Um you know, I shouldn't go for the, I shouldn't go for the job. And we know that, you know, there's also a gender difference with that where men will look at certain criteria and they'll say, 
I've got four of the 10. That's me. I'm going for the job. Women are missing two or three. It's like, I'm not ready yet. Uh, we're working on that. We're working on helping people to experience themselves and, and be able to identify their strengths and really integrate really yes. who they who they are. And that there's there's a lot of comparative spaces of where you get to feel bad and and really understanding why that is, where that's coming from, and what you can do to not get stuck and to you know be able to help and to get to the next uh get to a different space in yourself and really be able to own who you are and own own yourself joyously i mean we we don't talk enough about joy frank i mean we talk we talk a lot about um you know other parts of life that are really very difficult. Mm. And joy doesn't come in neon lights. Most joy doesn't come in neon lights. You get neon lights moments very rarely. And, yeah. but nor is that, nor is that the goal. We need to look in the micro. We need to have a shift in the micro. So we don't miss our moments of joy. Mm. So we don't miss when you're walking your grandchild across the, the road and they go to hold your hand and they just look up at you and smile. Hmm. We have micro moments. And if you're missing micro moments, go smile at someone, say thank you to someone, start, start something. Yes. If you're not feeling it, start to give it. And I'm not saying this in, in, in any kind of a Pollyanna way, because we, from a neuropsychological perspective, and that that is an important thing to do because mm. you will feel better. Your chemicals, your neurotransmitters, you will feel better when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems to me that one of the problems is, is that we've, we've created a sort of an internal displacement in this culture. I was amazed, you know, when researching my book to find that most Americans uh, in our society and in all classes and walks of life move seven to eight times in their lifetime, just chasing job opportunities or for education. And so then, you know, you turn around and there's no mother there or mother-in-law, she's, you know, 500,000 miles away, you, you know, you've, you've moved from jobs and so on. It, you know, it, 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 if you were from another planet and never been to planet earth, there's a lot of stuff that we've take for granted about which the, the person doing the interplanetary travel would say, well, of course you're all lonely. You all moved away from your families. Um, your, your parents are in a retirement community and you live 500 miles away, you know? So we have built in gen, not just gender stratification, but we've also built in intergenerational, we've kind of broken the intergenerational links. You, you know, this book I mentioned, The Old Way um, by uh, Elizabeth uh, Marshall Thomas, one of the things that they took as a no brainer was not only were you always with your group and they moved together, but even when they sat down around the campfire, people were sitting close. It was typical, she said, that you know, you'd be sitting there touching the person next to you, um, not just in the family group. All these were just taken for granted. That's how we evolved. That's what we long for because it's our evolutionary survival history. But we've, you know, we've created a culture in which young people are off doing their thing online, old people are stuck in you know, care centers, a thousand miles away from family. You know, I look at the whole thing and it's just, to me anyway, the, these kind of uh, walls we're building between people. We move so often we don't even know our neighbor's names if we're living in a neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you multiply that. It, it, it seems to me that um, inevitably there are going to be people like you, uh, you know, Dr. Risa Riger, who are going to have to be doing a lot of work with individuals because we've created a culture in which unhappiness and loneliness is, is pretty easy to achieve, whereas a sense of joy that you're talking about is harder to achieve because of all these barriers we've mm -hmm. put in place. I don't know whether you think that's an over harsh critique of our culture or not, but that's the way I'm, I'm tending to look at it. I can understand. I can understand that. And there is a lot of loneliness and there isn't a lot of isolation mm. and a lot of um, loneliness while in a crowd, because what we're looking for is connection. Mm. When I was talking and talking about attunement, we're looking for connection. 
And we and we're looking for very importantly, and I was discussing this um, just yesterday, acknowledgement. Yes. That even when you you're you're getting your coffee from someone in the morning, to acknowledge them. Yes. And you yes. never know. You want to feel good. You never know what that acknowledgement is going to mean to someone else. Mm -hmm. When someone sees that you're struggling with a back and they open a door for you. Yeah. That there's, that there's something about being seen. We exist and we need to have our existence recognized. We need to, you know, for, for children. And we're, it's the same thing. It's the same stuff, Frank. It's just yeah. over time, neurologically, it's different. You know, we, we, from our earliest times, we see ourselves reflected back by the people that we love. Yes. What are they reflecting back to us? And when no one is reflecting you back to yourself, no one is seeing you and saying, hey, or, or just by their demeanor, just like, I am happy to see you. Hmm. What a big thing that is. Yeah. What a big thing it is to have people think about you, wonder about you. Hmm wonder how i wonder how they're doing i wonder how they're feeling. haven't heard from them in a while mm -hmm. so what do we get to do and this is something i talk about a lot um during the pandemic is reach out to someone reach out to someone mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be big it doesn't have to be a whole to do but just hey how are you doing we haven't spoken in a while i was wondering what was up with you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And get yourself out there. What I know for sure is that, and I don't have my mug. I have my mug on the other side of the room. Right. Is that you've got to start somewhere. And we're, we're, I think sometimes we get stuck is that we think we have to do something big. We have to do the big rollout, the big change. And that's generally not how it happens. And so whatever it is, something beats nothing. Yes. Every single day. Yes. Something beats nothing. And so I also wanted to say that for people who are having a hard time or get a morning routine. And I have a couple of F's that I start with um, is that you need to, to start yourself off to get into a better mindset for your day. As human beings, we just like go into our day. If you were starting a marathon, you wouldn't go out and just start running. You need to have a little warm up period. And so if you can, and I'm, I'm a mom, I was a mom of young kids. So this whole thing about having an hour, if I had an hour, I would, I would be what's wrong here. But take a few minutes for yourself, find something that you can finish get your feet outside. We know this. Finish something, do it, do some task that has an end so that you have like finished, checked off in your head, hmm. get your feet outside, get back into the earth, whether you have to stick your head out the window, whatever it takes, get yourself back into the earth and take a minute. And this is a breathing exercise that I teach people. I call it Dr. Riker's four plus four equals eight. Hmm. Inhale for four, hold for four, and exhale for eight. And that helps you focus. Focus is a point of integration. That's hmm. when the different parts of your brain are working together and are connecting with your body. That is a tremendous space of integration. And when you're in a more integrative state, when you're experiencing more integration, it makes you more ready hmm. to take on what's you know what's in front of you and to be available for you know for what the next moment is about so you can really be present for your life and i'm not using this terminology to use over overused sure. terminology but it really has to do with are we in our own lives with ourselves mm -hmm. and be able to take in what is in the world for us and taking in our micro moments, giving somebody else a micro moment. And so don't end your day. Don't end your day without having some moment of internal uptick for yourself. So let me ask you this. We've got a, a minute or so here. I like this thing. Let's finish with something specific. I'm going to do my wrap up and then come back to you. Um, I've been talking with uh, Risa Riger, who is a friend and someone we've talked with in other places, but um, 
if you want to get in touch with her and, and avail yourself of, of some of her wisdom and counseling, there are going to be links everywhere this shows or is listened to. But do you want to lead us as if we're one of your clients in your four plus four uh, to take us out and just show us again how to do that? And then we will wind up with that. Give us something specific to go out on. Okay. So by the way, I just want to say that you don't have to be any place special. You could be walking to get your cup of coffee. You could be sitting right. in your car. It doesn't have to be quiet. It doesn't have to be any of that. So Frank, I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through this. Okay. All right? I'm all set. Okay. All right. So breathe in for a count of four. One, two, three, four. Hold for four. One, two, three, four. Breathe slowly out for eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I would say repeat. So the first thing that you're doing is that you're bringing oxygen in, you're experiencing your body, and on the breathing out for eight, you're activating the parasympathetic branch of your autonomic nervous system to signal to your body that you're okay and you're in a safe place so that you can be ready to take in rather than to push away. Well, thank you. And we uh, really appreciate you being on with us today. Please get in touch um, with Dr. Reiger when you uh, have any more questions or needs um, and, and avail yourself of her wisdom and her expertise in counseling. And thank you so much. It's always so great to be with you. I enjoy sitting in on the seminars that you're conducting with people. Keep inviting me to stuff. I like being part of it. And we will see you out there. See you out there, Frank. It's been really a pleasure to spend yeah, this time here. with you. Wonderful talking with you. Thanks.